This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Several times a year, the church where I preach in Denver, Colorado, goes out and provides food and water for the homeless in downtown Denver. We have done this to try and share God's love for them. We realize that there are organizations that exist to provide help for these individuals. And we know that these individuals are homeless for different reasons, and we can't possibly meet all the needs that they have. And perhaps the greatest challenge for us would be to provide them, every one of them, with a roof over their heads. And yet, we realize that that's important to all of us, to have shelter and protection, to have a home. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talks about a place that God has made for an entire race of people who were homeless. They may have had physical shelter from the elements, but in the most important sense of all, they were totally exposed. Paul says that the people of Ephesus were a part of those who were once the walking dead, verse 1. They were dead in trespasses and sins, and they walked according to the course of this world. It was a course, a walk that was led by the lust of their flesh and by them indulging in their, their fleshly desires. And then that's when God went to work on building the house. And God could do it because he was rich. It takes resources to do this. And Paul tells us God is rich in mercy. He's rich in love and he's rich in grace, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. But we were standing outside in the cold until Christ made a way for us by dying on the cross. It's so thrilling to read that section of Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 11 through 18, where he took a law out of the way, we who were afar off and separated from God, and he brought us near by the blood of his Son. And that's where I want to pick up in our reading. If you have your Bibles and can turn to Ephesians chapter 2, I want to notice something that the Apostle Paul says starting in verse 19. Ephesians 2, verse 19. He says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the, the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. You know, in another letter concerning this church, the church at Ephesus, Paul says that the house of God is his church. Paul says, But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. But that's not just true of the Ephesus church in 1 Timothy 3.15. It is true of every congregation, even today in the 21st century, that is trying to be the church that we read about on the pages of the New Testament. Paul's message is that there is a place, a community, for everybody who is interested in following Jesus Christ. You know, as we examine Ephesians chapter 2, and as I think about you and I today, and all those that we love and care about, I'd like us to think about this house that Paul says that God built. God designed it to do more than provide shelter from sin and from eternal death. He designed it to be a place where you and I can find a common identity and a purpose together. Now, I can't give you the exact dimensions of this house except to say that there is room for everybody who wants to be inside of it. And the only reason that you and I have to be homeless is if we choose to be. So what I'd like us to do, I don't know if you've ever bought a house or not, but if you do, you know what's an important part of that is to have an inspection. I want us to do that today. I'd like us to put on our house inspection hat for a few moments. And I want to examine this house of God from Ephesians chapter 2. 
And as we begin our examination process in this home inspection, I'd like us to start with the foundation. I suppose it's fair to say that the worst problem to have in a home inspection is with the foundation. Quicken Loans Vice President Mike Lyons said, if the home inspector puts a golf ball down on one side of the house and it rolls to the other side, then you need to walk away. The Burj Khalifa is a very fascinating building. It's the tallest building in the world. It is more than one half a mile high and is double the height of the Empire State Building. It cost about one and a half billion dollars to build, has the most floors of any building, has the highest observation deck of any building as, at 124 floors. And while most of the attention focuses on its height, what's more important is what lies beneath. Extending 164 feet deep under the Burj Khalifa is 59,000 cubic yards of concrete weighing over 120,000 tons. It took a year just to build the foundation. But what kind of foundation is sufficient to put under the house of God? Well, Paul tells us. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11, he says, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Nothing will suffice to substitute for that foundation. You know, Jesus warned that building on another foundation will cause cat catastrophe when tests come, and they will come. Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus says that whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, he is like a man who builds his house upon the rock, and the rains came and the, uh, uh, the uh, des and descended, and, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it stood, for it was founded on a rock. But there's the other who built upon the sand, and the winds and the storms, uh, they came and they blew, and the house fell, and great was its fall. What Jesus is saying is that he is the rock, and all other uh, ground is sinking sand. And every life is going to endure some pretty significant tests. The Federal Reserve Bank in New York City contains 122 vaults. Each vault can hold 100,000 bricks of gold, each brick weighing approximately 30 pounds. More gold in there than Fort Knox. And these vaults all lie behind a 90-ton steel door. But the only reason that it can hold all of that gold is because it lies on the bedrock of Manhattan Island, which is comprised of three interfolded layers of metamorphic rock and marble and granite, and it varies from 150 to 500 feet thick. But the right natural disaster or man-made disaster might destroy that foundation, might destroy the foundation of the Burj Khalifa. But Paul's point in Ephesians 2 and in 1 Corinthians 3 is there is nothing strong enough to shake anybody whose life is truly built on Christ. Paul says that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. These are the individuals who made known the good news about Jesus. Ephesians 3 and verse 5, they, they revealed the mystery. Who we are to be as a church in our teaching and our worship and everything about us is determined by what these men wrote in the New Testament. The apostles and prophets, they revealed God's will for us through the books of the New Testament. But Paul says that Jesus is the cornerstone. Now, a cornerstone is a stone that forms the base of a corner of a building. It joins two walls together. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter. He says that Jesus is a living stone, verse 4. He is a choice, that is a high-quality stone. And he is a precious stone, hard to be duplicated, replicated, verse 4. But Peter goes on to call him a stone rejected by men, 1 Peter 2, 4 and 7. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, verse 8. And at the same time, the stone that was laid by God, verse 6. Ultimately, this house is run God's way because it's God's house, and Christ is the foundation of it. And who is there who knows better how to tell us how to live and what to build our lives on than the very one who made us and who saved us? 
You know, we live in a world that doesn't know where it came from, doesn't know why it's here, does, have, has no idea where it's going. But building life on the foundation of Christ gives me perfect clarity on all of that. I want to be a part of a house that is built on the right foundation, Jesus Christ. And so as I have on my, my home inspection hat, I look at the foundation and I see it's Jesus. It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. It's a solid foundation. But as I continue to inspect the house, I also want to look at the builder. You know, when you think about house building projects, whether it's a, a, a subdivision or if it's an individual home, builders have reputations. You ask yourself, who's the builder of this house? Who is the one who uh, is doing the work? Do they use shoddy materials? Do they use good materials? And some have a reputation for cutting corners. I don't want that kind of a builder. But what Paul says here is that Jesus is the cornerstone of God's house for us. But Paul adds that in him, the whole building is being fitted together. Did you know that that word is only found in Ephesians and only found twice? It's found right here in Ephesians 2.21, and it's found in Ephesians 4.16, and it means to join together so as to form a coherent entity, that which is put together. Now, we're going to look at the Ephesians 4 passage a little bit later and talk about how we hold each other together. But here it is Christ that holds us all together. Jesus is the architect and, and the builder of his church. In Matthew 16, 18, he said, I will build my church. But he's also the foundation. He's the foundation, he's the builder, and now he is the mortar or the nails that fastens it all together. He's also the purchaser of the church. Acts 20 and verse 28, the apostle Paul tells the Ephesian elders that he bought that church with his own blood. So if he designed it, he built it, he's the nails and the mortar, he's the purchaser, wouldn't you say that Jesus is totally invested in God's house and he is interested in us being held together? I find it amazing who Jesus brings together in God's house. In God's house, Jesus builds with white and black, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American people. He builds with newborns and the very elderly in every life stage in between. He builds with accountants and engineers and waitresses and construction workers and lawyers and farmers and welders and teachers and nurses and retail specialists and people and dozens and dozens and dozens of other professions. He builds with people who grew up in church and people who hadn't spent much time in church. No wonder Paul calls him a wise master builder. He builds his church in the way that he knows is best, in the way that helps us the best. And part of that is getting us to stretch and grow and to be united with people who look like us and people that don't look like us. People we have a lot in common with and those that we have less in common with. And to argue against that is to argue against the man who died to build his church. You know, the University of Amsterdam has confirmed what artwork has been trying to tell us. That is, that the ancient Egyptians moved the two and a half ton pyramid stones by means of friction. They would wet the desert sand in front of their sleds to firm it up, the sand. That cut the force required to move the sled in half. And so there's a design to reduce the friction. You know, when we think about true friendships and healthy family relationships, we know there's going to be friction. We all have opinions. We have feelings. We have desires. We have goals. And sometimes they conflict with our loved ones. Think about family reunions or family gatherings at, at holidays. And God's house, His church is no different. He wants all those diverse, different kinds of people to allow themselves to be stones in the master builder's hands. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5, And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, 
but as choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And how does he expect us to behave as he gives us all a place in his house? Here's what he says. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The architect is the one who determines the layout of the house. And the builder is the one who executes the blueprints. Remarkably, Jesus is the architect and he's the builder. And while the metaphor is, not, is of a body and not of a building, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the principle is exactly the same. Paul says, But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. 1 Corinthians 12, 18. So think about the builder. Jesus the builder takes all of us who are submissive to his will, who become obedient to him to do what he says it takes to be part of God's house, and he builds the house on us. And that leads me to a third observation I want to make from Ephesians 2. As we have on our home inspection hats and we look at the foundation and we look at the builder, those are both Jesus, I also want you to check out the quality of the building materials. Paul ends this discussion with a beautiful picture. He says, you are being built together. Now in context, Paul is talking about Jew and Gentile. The Jews were God's chosen people of the Old Testament, and Gentiles are everybody else. But in application, Paul is talking about all the different groups, like I mentioned a moment ago, of different races, of different jobs, of different religious backgrounds who come to Christ. You know, the articles and the reports and the studies have been steadily pouring in over the past decade. We're becoming so much more isolated as a society and that didn't just start with the computer and the internet. More people took jobs in far off places in the sea of urban humanity. They left their small town communities and they moved far away from home. That means that we live next door to relative strangers rather than lifelong friends. But you know, the internet and smartphones have definitely not remedied that isolation. Those reporting feeling most alone are those who are most connected to technology, those who are under the age of 35. 48% of the people in that age group reported having only one confidant, but only 25 years ago, a similar study found that those in this age range had an average of three confidants. The author of Alone Together, Sherry Turkle, writes that social networking is an all-too-convenient tool for avoiding sometimes harsh realities and playing pretend with your life. Forbes magazine offered seven strategies for building a real social network, and they say, unplug, get away from that. Don't spend all your time, be balanced in your usage. Number two, become a better listener. Number three, engage in your real community, not your virtual community. Practice conversation. Find like minds with yourself. Reconnect with long lost friends and invite people into your home. Ream upon ream of studies and suggestions highlight the fact that we crave real community. You see, God has a timeless answer for that basic human need of human touch and community. The answer is He builds us together in the church of His Son. That's the community where He puts us together. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 15, and 16, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You see, the church is fitted and built together 
by what every member contributes. All of us have a history. All of us have a story. And all of that has value and meaning to every other person who makes up the church of our Lord. We all have a part to play. We all have something to add. We have something that we can contribute to the overall good. We support each other. I love what Paul says in Romans 12, 15. He says, we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11 says that we encourage and we build up one another. Hebrews 12, verse 12 and 13 says that we strengthen the weak, the feeble, and the broken. Ephesians 3, verse 9 through 11 tells us that the church was in God's mind from eternity. He had a plan before the creation of the world that involved the church. Not only do we find purpose in His church, but we find special people to share life with. I'm, I'm not really understood in reading my Bible why people say, I want Jesus, but not the church. I'm spiritual, but not religious, and so the church isn't all that important. Well, you, you've not read Ephesians if that's what you believe. The book of Ephesians emphasizes the church that belongs to Jesus and tells us how eternally important it is in God's mind and in, and in its reality today. I'm a big baseball fan. Colorado Rockies are my first team, but I love good baseball history stories. And the 1979 Pittsburgh Pirates are a story like that. They won the World Series and they would tell you that they believe their close-knit relationship as a team played a big part in their success. Their theme song was the disco hit, We Are Family. You know, we sing a song at church sometimes that says, we're part of a family that's been born again. Part of a family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, and sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be. When we all get to heaven, God's family. That's what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 2. He has shown us the foundation, he has given us the builder, and now he has shown us the building materials that make up this house of God, the church, which God has given to us to help us to make it through this world. You know, there's a huge difference in how Ephesians 2 begins and ends. At the beginning of the chapter, we're dead in sin. We're disobedient. We have no hope, and we're without God. But now, in Christ Jesus, it's different. We're near to God. We have peace. We have access to the Father. And as great as any blessing is that in Christ, we get to be members of God's house. Christ is the foundation and the builder of that house. But he chose to make the house out of ordinary, faulty human beings like you and me. What a beautiful plan. You know, I think about my beautiful wife, Kathy. She and I were happily serving God 1,700 miles away from our present home near Richmond, Virginia. And we were invited to come to Denver, Colorado, a new culture a different region of the United States, two days away from our parents and most of the rest of our family. But it only took us a weekend to see how special God's family is. Here in a new place, we found in Colorado what we had found in Virginia and what I saw growing up in Georgia and in Alabama. God's family is like that, special and precious. I believe that you find the same thing when you find the church of the New Testament, the church of Christ. When you examine what Scripture says and you see God's plan and pattern and design for the church, 
you see in God's precious people, members of the New Testament church, that same thing. There are so many men, women, and children who make the church of our Lord a happy home. The thing is, are you a member of the church that we read about in the New Testament? If you're interested in knowing more about how to be a member of that church, the church that Jesus died to purchase, we ask you to reach out to us and let us show you what the New Testament says. I've always heard it said, it's not a matter of who's right, it's a matter of what's right. And what's right is what God's Word says. And we can study and reason together and see what God says about how to be a member of His church. Nobody can vote you into that. The Lord adds you to His church when you obey His will. You can start reading in the book of Acts and see how they did it then. But I encourage you to investigate the church of Christ to see how you might become part of God's family.